Okay. Okay. Great. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Krista Kovilitu today. Um, she's a world-renowned um, high-energy astrophysicist. Um, she's currently the chair of physics at the George Washington University. And before 2015, she was at NASA Marshall uh, Space Flight Center. Um, Krista has worked um, on a number of um, broad and really vital issues in high-energy astrophysics starting out with understanding, contributing to our basic understanding of gamma ray bursts, which are the most powerful explosions, amongst the most powerful explosions in the universe, um, and then now um, concentrating on magnetars, which are um, highly magnetized, highly rapidly rotating neutron stars that have been linked to a number of amazing and spectacular transients and explosions, including gamma ray bursts. Um, uh, in her long um, and productive career, she has uh, garnered a number of prizes, which I won't have time to mention all, but I will mention a few, which include the AAS Heinemann Prize and the Bruni Rossi Prize, the NASA Exceptional Service Medal, um, and most recently, the 2021 Shaw Prize that was given uh, along with um, Cassidy. <laughs> and uh, as I also learned in 2012, um, um, she was elected as Time Magazine's 25 Most Influential People in Space. <laughs> I presume not literally in space, <laughs> but uh, people in space physics, I presume. I so, never figured out why they, they uh, allocated that title to me, to be honest with you. <laughs> Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> yeah, so no, so we're very excited. Uh, so please, um, mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's welcome Krista. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, my name is uh, Mariam said is Chris Kuveliotu, and uh, I'm delighted to uh, give my first uh, presentation after the uh, pandemic, after the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk to you today about magnetars, which are the extremes of the high energy universe. And I let me make sure. Yes. Uh, magnetars are transient stars. Let me uh, change this because I see, I don't see the screen. Okay, now I can see the screen because I took your faces, I'm sorry, away from the screen. Uh, so magnetars are high energy and they are transient phenomena. Uh, and uh, we dis discovered those in X-rays and gamma rays. Uh, since they are transient phenomena, I thought it might work better if I could show you uh, a qualitative uh, scale of transient phenomena and where magnetars actually fall into this. Uh, if you look at the, uh, can you see my uh, my cursor, my pointer? Yes. yes. Okay. So this uh, this line actually indicates a qualitative scale of variability starting from milliseconds going up to years and also different sources that are the origin, the central engines of this variability. Uh, so there are uh, stellar mass black holes here associated with different um, transient phenomena, uh, like gamma ray bursts, long and, and short gamma ray bursts. And then there are neutron stars, and then there are intermediate mass black holes and supermassive black holes. Uh, so magnetars are occupying this little sliver of area, uh, which is between milliseconds and seconds, actually. They're, that's the overlap with the short gamma ray bursts, because there's three types of magnetar bursts, which I will discuss later. So it looks like uh, they are at the very short end of transient uh, sources or variability, and they are also neutron star. Uh, central engines. And I think I did it. Okay. So I thought I should give you a very brief description at the beginning of what magnetars are, just in case I lose you somehow halfway. Uh, magnetars are slowly rotating, as Mariam said, magnetically powered neutron stars. And they have extreme magnetic fields. When I say extreme, are up to 10 to the 15 Gauss. Uh, they are persistent and transient X-ray sources. We have some magnetars that are always visible and some that occur randomly 
uh, in outbursts. Uh, when they do enter into active outbursts, they emit from tens to several hundreds, and in cases, some cases, thousands of hard X-ray and soft gamma ray bursts. Today, we have 30 sources which we think are magnetars. In some cases, we have evidence that they are magnetars, but in some cases, we're still collecting them. Four of them have emitted giant flares, which are very rare phenomena. I will talk about them later. One is, and three of these magnetars are confirmed extragalactic. Uh, there is no evidence of binarity. Uh, we have looked, and there was in fact at the beginning of the Magnetar story, uh, there were a lot of arguments discuss discussing whether the actual emissions are due to accretion disks from a binary companion. We have not been able to identify binarity in these sources, and we're still trying. Uh, so they emit in x-rays, in infrared, in optical, and in radio. And here I have a comparison of different P fields to give you a, an idea of the scale of magnetic fields in magnetars compared to other objects. For instance, our galaxy has a very low magnetic field. Uh, planets have much higher. Jupiter is the one with the highest magnetic field, 1,000 Gauss. Earth has 0.6, and the solar general field is 5 Gauss, while the sunspots have very strong magnetic fields of 1,000 Gauss. The common refrigerator magnet is 100 Gauss, and the average magnetic resonance imager uh, field is 15,000 Gauss. And every time I read that and have an MRI, I think about it. Uh, strongest sustained laboratory fields are about 4.5 times 10 to the 5 Gauss and man-made, and but not, uh, uh, not sustained uh, magnetic fields are 10 to the 7 Gauss. The bulk of radio pulsars have magnetic fields between 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 Gauss and magnetars take the cake with 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 Gauss. Their distribution in our galaxy, uh, have, I haven't been able to update it with the four more sources, is, uh, is so this is the galactic plane. This is our galaxy uh, by Churchwell and uh, et al. And what you see here is the, this is the sun and you can see the actual directions of magnetars because in many cases, we do not actually have the real distances. So if you just see the lines, uh, you actually know that we don't have the distance. This guy here, for instance, has a distance and this one has a distance. It's not easy to measure distances. We need to associate them with other objects in order to be able to identify the real distance. And uh, this is of course uh, the collection here of uh, magnetars that we have today. Uh, some of them are old sources that were reactivated, and some of them are what we used to call soft gamma repeaters and anomalous X, anomalous X ray pulsars. Their detection rate uh, actually became very steep in, uh, in rising once the SWIFT observatory, actually, these letters are the BATSI, uh, the uh, Rossi X ray timing explorer. BATSI was a gamma ray burst experiment on the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. This is the launch of the Rossi X ray timing explorer. Uh, and then that was the SWIFT and the Fermi Observatory. And you can tell that SWIFT made a huge difference in detecting uh, um, magnetars compared to the other instruments. So that wasn't really a history, but I'm gonna go now into a touch of history. Uh, as Mariam said, the um, magnetars, actually I started working on gamma ray bursts. And this is the first paper uh, on gamma ray bursts by Ray Klebe, Sadley and Strong and Roy Olson. This was actually uh, a, a groundbreaking uh, paper. It was a new phenomenon, and it was extremely uh, rare. At that time, when they started in 1973, there were very few 
but at the beginning, they weren't even sure that this was a real phenomenon, but there were very few people who even knew what a gamma ray burst was. Actually, I did my PhD on gamma ray bursts. It was the first PhD, I think, on gamma ray bursts. Uh, so as we were looking in the sky for gamma ray bursts, an interesting event happened. There was a flaring, it was called by Eugene Mazet, a flaring X-ray pulsar in Dorado which was in the LMC, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Basically, this was originally classified as a gamma ray burst because we knew gamma ray burst and we couldn't figure else what it was. But the problem is that it was actually uh, oscillating with eight seconds, more or less, which gamma ray bursts don't re really do. They are catastrophic phenomena, they don't, uh, the, uh, the uh, initial source is destroyed. So basically uh, what you see here is something that's sustained for 65 seconds and has a very coherent, so almost coherent periodicity. Uh, so the first part of this event was so short, it was microsecond ri rise time and about 50 milliseconds, if I remember correctly, duration for this peak. It was beyond the scale. It was extremely bright and this was the tail. So the question was, what is this event? Is it a gamma ray burst? That's what we knew and that's what we called it. Uh, that event differed Differ, differed, sorry, sharply in its properties from all the gamma ray bursts we detected previously. And the energy spectrum of this event indicated that it didn't have a lot of similarity to any gamma ray burst spectra, because the, this initial peak, which you can't see um, enlarged, uh, was very hard, MEV, uh, hard. I'm sorry, when I say hard, I guess you uh, understand what I'm talking about, right? High energy and soft is low energy photons. So this source had a very hard initial spike and a very soft tail, not very common. What happened later was that this particular source started emitting more bursts which really was very clearly not associated with a catastrophic phenomenon and created a lot of discussions in the community, in the gamma ray burst community. Very soon after we found two new sources, which also repeated bursts and a lot of discussion ensued and a lot of arguments ensued. What are these phenomena? Is it a new phenomenon or is it just gamma ray bursts of a different kind? Uh, soon became obvious that we were actually looking at a new phenomenon, which was associated with neutron stars instead of black holes, which we think are the remnants of gamma ray bursts. So in not knowing the best name for them, we decided to simply call them soft gamma repeaters, soft sources, gamma ray emitters, and repeating emitters, SGRs. And that's what uh, we started with. The very first uh, series of papers that came out from one of these new sources that uh, uh, we observed was, was a struggle on how to arrange publications. As you can see, this is the, uh, the quirks of the profession. We had the same team in three different papers in three different first authorships because this was a very interesting discovery and everybody wanted to actually get some part of the pie, uh, which is actually something that all scientists do in the particular when there aren't many events, namely just two. So we had a series of papers and at the same time, these were observational papers. And at the same time, we had two theorists Bob, Rob Duncan and Chris Thompson, excellent and very uh, admire, admirable uh, collaborators and friends, uh, who actually had come up with the name magnetars, 
because we didn't invent the name. Rob and Chris invented the name. And basically they defined them as neutron stars with dipole fields in excess of the field of 4.4 times 10 to the 13 Gauss. Uh, so basically what they said was uh, possible manifestations of magnetars include soft gamma repeaters, anomalous X-ray pulsars, which I will talk about in a minute, and classical gamma ray bursts. I guess this is the only if I have with them that doesn't actually um, apply to classical gamma ray bursts, but that was just the beginning. And then, of course, anomalous X-ray pulsars are soft spectrum pulsating X-ray sources with histories of uniform spin down. Basically, it was a source, a group of X-ray bursts that actually uh, had extremely similar, not bursts, sorry, X-ray sources, uh, wh which has similar properties. And they were set aside from the rest of the X-ray sources. So these two were pulled into the magnetar group. So that happened in 1995, when they were also identified as, as a subset of X-ray pulsars with common properties. So as I just said in a minute ago, sorry, I can't get my cursor here. Hey. Uh, so in 1998, um, uh, let me go back a second. Uh, I submitted a proposal to the Ross X-ray Timing Explorer uh, to observe the next energetic active magnetar or source, a gamma ray burster as we called it, that would be active, that would become active. It, that happened and uh, so we observed and we not only did we uh, find, confirm the uh, spin period of the neutron star, but we also were able to measure the uh, spin down, the derivative of the spin period. And from that, we could calculate the magnetic field of the neutron star, which turned out to be of the order, the, the age turned out to be 1,500 years and about eight times 10 to the 14 Gauss, which was at the moment the highest field measured. So that more or less demonstrated the existence of magnetars and that started the magnetar uh, research in earnest. Uh, there were very few people who were working on magnetars at that time. Uh, you couldn't even have a meeting with them because it was of the order of a, hand, uh, um, a handful. So basically uh, it took some time, but the field now is very active and there's a lot going on with many more sources that we are detecting. So the neutron star populations comprising magnetars are now soft gamma repeaters, anomalous X-ray pulsars, dim isolated neutron stars, that says it all, and uh, Compact central X-ray objects, basically this is the central X-ray objects that we don't know what their nature is. One of them turned out to be a magnetar and then rotation powered pulsars like the one uh, in, indicated there with the very high magnetic field, the same with the other one. And maybe some other objects that will come by. The difference between the magnetic fields and the, mag and the nature of magnetars and radio pulsars is illustrated here from an article we wrote with Rob Duncan and uh, Chris Thompson at the Scientific American. We start with an ordinary star of about eight to 20 solar masses. And when it collapses, you have a neutron star. Now, if the neutron star rotates very fast and the convection rate is very high, that results in the production of a magnetar. So if you take the same uh, start between zero and 10 seconds, both of them rotate, they build up their magnetic field, uh, and then the magnetic field decays. And uh, for about 10,000 years, the source is visible, but above 10,000 years, most of the energy has gone and the source is becoming an, a dead neutron star. 
the radio pulsars have a lifetime of zero to 10 million years, and they take that long to exhaust their energy reservoir. Uh, so basically, magnetars die young, uh, and radio pulsars last much longer. So what is the magnetar conjecture, as we call it? So the neutron star, the conjecture is that the neutron star is actually powered by its super strong magnetic field. Uh, and in order to create such fields, uh, you have, we have to have, nature has to have a collapse of the fast rotating star of the order of one to three milliseconds with a very high convection rate. So, magnetic Reynolds number more than about 10 to the 17. Uh, ideal efficiency can generate 10 to the 16 Gauss, according to Duncan and Thompson. However, it has to be less than the gravitational binding energy of the neutron star, because otherwise the neutron star will fall apart. This requirement is in the first equation. And if you solve from the equation, or the in uh, um, ah, I can think of the name of this symbol. Sorry about that. Uh, that the magnetic field has to be less than ten to the eighteen Gauss. So that's the maximum that the magnetic field can be before it breaks the star. And if you want a nice picture on that, you can actually see the neutron star, which act, which has. It is a hot newborn star, churns a lot, mixes a lot, high convection rate. And uh, if it spins faster than 200 revolutions per second, it builds up a very strong dynamo and uh, then magnetic field. So this is a general description of magnetars, but magnetars have different states. They have the quiescent state and they have the active state. When they are active, quiescent means that they are just sitting there at the, at the very steady um, uh, persistent emission level. And occasionally they undergo intervals of outburst of activity. These intervals are completely unpredictable for their appearance and for their duration. And it, also, it is also unpredictable how many bursts they will emit. There are several categories. It's not really category. It's just a uh, logistic, uh, uh, um, um, logistic description here. Several hundreds of bursts, which we call storms. Sometimes there is thousands of bursts in the storms. And there's about five sources we have shown that. Giant flares, so there's actually three sources, one each. A uh, few tens of bursts with uh, only three sources have shown that. And less than 10 bursts, less about 10 sources. And there are four sources that only show increase in their persistent emission and they don't show any bursts. So the properties of the quiescent state of magnetars are, um, we use the quiescent emission, the quiescent pulsed X-ray emission to calculate the minimum surface dipole field in a vacuum, which basically is three times 10 to the 19 pp dot uh, square, sorry, uh, square root. Uh, so that is the minimum magnetic field strength in vacuum. The spin down luminosity is given also by the uh, <laughs> moment of inertia and p dot over third power. And uh, that's the characteristic age, uh, which is p over two p dot. So these are the three uh, equations that basically provide information on the magnetic field of this neutron star, as well as the uh, period of the neutron star. The values of the period are typically higher. Uh, sorry, this is p dot. Uh, a dot must have fallen somewhere, I don't know. Are typically higher in SGRs, which are five to minus 11, to six to the minus 11. And this result 
uh, these result in uh, magnetic fields, which are ranging between six to, to eight times 10 to the 14 Gauss and spin down ages of 1.3 to 1.9 times 1,000 years. The AXPs have smaller P dots and uh, they correspond to, um, to uh, smaller fields and characteristic ages that are higher. Actually, there is only one that is that high, but I had to put it there as an upper limit uh, because a lot of them are much younger, much uh, less, uh, they live much less actually. But there is one that uh, is coming up up to 220,000 years. The first measurements that we did involve this source, 1806 minus 20. It had a period of 7.5 seconds and a P dot eight times 10 to the minus eight, 11, which corresponded to a B field uh, of that of 10, eight times 10 to the 14 Gauss. Uh, the next source that came up was uh, also 5.6 times 10 to the 14 Gauss, very similar P dot as well. So these were the two sources that we identified as magnetos, the first two sources, very similar magnetic fields. Um, they have long spin periods and they have a very rapid spin down. And here I am bringing up this, uh, oops, these three sources that are the exceptions, because obviously there are always exceptions to the rules. These are very low magnetic fields. And uh, for these sources compared to the other ones I mentioned, and basically the idea was that we are actually looking at the dipole surface field. And in this case, we don't look at the dipole surface field. So that basically uh, is the explanation or the suggested explanation, I should say. Uh, active state properties. Okay, so when it becomes active, and this is actually the 1945 source, which is uh, basically uh, very close to Sagittarius A, the center of our galaxy. Uh, so before and after 2008, that source did not exist. And 2013, when it became active, it almost surpasses, it doesn't really, but it looks like it surpasses the brightness of the center, galactic center but they do become very bright when they are active. What do they look like when you have enough data to follow the evolution of their light curves? Here we have the bolometric luminosity on the x-axis, sorry, the y-axis, and the duration of the observation in the x-axis, which ranges from 0.1 to about two, 3,000 days, as far as we can follow them. It looks like all these sources are different sources, and some of them are being followed for a long period, and some of them for a short period, because they, we cannot keep the observations for a long time. So you can see that they start from a very low, um, relatively low uh, brightness, but they are all observed during their activation. Some of them, we have uh, historical data, uh, which we can uh, add, and their, their quiescent luminosity is much less. But here it is after the activation. So basically, you can see there's definitely at least the majority of trends, and some of them we lose very early. Uh, this is a recent uh, result by Alice Borghese et al. in 2020 of a source that was practically one of the first, if not the first source actually followed up, uh, XTE 1810-197. This is 16 years of monitoring. And the reason I put it there is because it shows what happens when the source becomes active. This is the, the quiescence level of the source. And the source became active and, and uh, actually doubled. It's actually, uh, it didn't double, it actually uh, uh, increased its uh, uh, luminosity by a factor of 10. And uh, then it went down 
in about a thousand days and stayed there until there was another uh, activation about 16 or so years later, or actually uh, from the very beginning that is. And uh, now this is expanding the, uh, the decay, uh, which is here in, in the small box. And that is 58 to 50, it's about 300 days decay. And that one was much longer, about a thousand days decay. So that decayed much faster and you can see from that one as well. So it doesn't, what I'm trying to say is there is not um, an, a trend fit all here. They can have different trends in different intervals where they become active and the way they decay. One of the major characteristics of the magnetars are their bursts. And uh, they have what we call giant flares. I will talk about them at about the end of the talk. And uh, so basically uh, the, uh, the giant flares are the most energetic um, expressions of magnetars. They're all of the order of 10 to the 45 arcs per second, which is about uh, 10 to the eight less than the, than the peaks of gamma ray burst. There's not, they're not as energetic. And then we have the intermediate flares, which uh, are multiple in particular during burst storms. And then we have the short burst, the working horse of magnetars, which last about 0.1 to 200, 100 to 250 milliseconds. And they have unpredictable onset of activity and thousands are detected. And their energies are 10 to the 30 ergs, eight ergs per second in general, a little bit more. So these are the short bursts. Uh, the uh, scale here is seconds. So this is about 0.1 second. And this is a very short burst as we just discussed. Uh, and uh, they can have different structures. They can have multi peaks. They last 400 milliseconds. And here, this gap is due to saturation of the instrument because the, this deep here is because it was too bright for the instrument. So it's saturated until it came back. Intermediate soft, ga so soft gamma repeater bursts are uh, 10 to the 41 to the 42 ergs, uh, but there is a continuum of energies. This is 140, 150 seconds. And I uh, will not discuss the uh, giant flares until a little bit later, but that would be the next, uh, the next uh, uh, form of bursts that magnetars emit. Uh, the, I mentioned burst storms. This is one of them. This is in hours, and there were 450 bursts from the source in 24 hours. And we have several sources that really made us work really hard to analyze all these bursts. 450 bursts analysis is not really uh, a very fast progress, a very fast task, I should say. So what happens when the outburst takes effect to the persistent flux of the sources? For instance, here we have 1806 minus 20, one of the first detected sources. And what you see here is the number of bursts per, um, I think it's per week, but uh, I have to confirm that, sorry. Uh, so basically these are the bursts. And in 2015, or just before, uh, the source was very active. It emitted hundreds, thousands of bursts as well. And this is the distribution, and then it stopped emitting for several years. At the same time, the spin of the, of the source changed twice. Here, there was a break here and another break here. And in fact, there was another break here as well. So, uh, that means that the source either something affected the source to, to spin uh, slower. So what happened is we, we thought that would have been uh, a, uh, associated with the outburst here, but it wasn't uh, because there was no, the break became after. So if it is, a, there is a latency in the break, if anything, 
that we can tell. And so the P dot is here and you can see the difference in, in here. So the, the lesson learned here is that uh, the actual outburst does not affect the spin of the source. It, something happens, but not at the same time when the outburst takes place. It's a uh, latency involved here uh, with, the, uh, with the outburst and the emission of many bursts. We don't really understand that yet as many other things in magnet as I have to stress. So what we see here is another trend that magnetars have. Uh, so that actually shows, this is from Gogus et al, uh, that shows that before the giant flare, the actual pulse profile is very rowdy, just kind of uh, rugged, I would say. And immediately after it becomes very sinusoidal. And it, as the time progresses, and it's a, this becomes a little bit more complicated, but it becomes, and that we see that in at least two or three sources, that it is becoming uh, very simple and very sinusoidal um, after an outburst. The spectra of the sources uh, in the persistent emission uh, are very simple. Yeah, they can, the luminosities are 10 to the 32, 10 to the 30 CX uh, ergs per second. And the X-ray spectrum usually is best fit with the black body and the power low. The power low has a temperature of 0.3 kV and the power low has sorry, the black body has a temperature of 3.3 kV and the power low has an index of 3.5. Uh, uh, also, this is actually detected up to about 30 or so kV, but there are cases where this persistent pulse emission in particular is detected up to the 20 to 150 kV source, uh, range in some sources. So, the emission origin, we think it is originating from uh, the twisted magnetosphere, which supports a very large electrical current, uh, which is causing a significant optical depth. The thermal emission from the hot neutron star surface will undergo resonant cyclotron, cyclotron scattering in the magnetosphere. So basically the net luminosity is due to the Comptonized X-ray photon scattering on the, uh, on the electrons, the accelerated electrons along line, the magnetic loops. That's one of the theories according to Thomson et al. Uh, the pulsed emission is interesting in the sense that the spectrum is in many cases extremely hard. So you can see that it goes up to about 100 MeV, which is amazing thinking uh, that the persistent emission, not the pulsed, uh, non-pulsed emission actually ends around um, tens of kV. And we have the pulsed emission. Sometimes in some sources, there is only pulsed emission that is detected in that range. The giant flare spectrum and the small burst or the uh, regular burst, so to speak, spectra, this is uh, just a line to indicate where you find them. Uh, so this is the small burst spectrum and the giant flare goes on higher energies, in particular, the, the first spike of the giant flare. So what is one of the suggestions, what the mechanism is for the magnetic field decay and what it is actually uh, achieving in the source is that basically, uh, again, from the Scientific American article we did, uh, it is a, a figurative process here. The, the whole idea is that most of the time the monitor is quiet uh, as uh, at some point, the magnetic stresses that have been building up stress the crust beyond its limit, which makes it fracture. And therefore, we have a star quake on the surface of the neutron star. There is a surging electric current 
uh, which also decays and leaves behind it a, a hot fireball. And the fireball calls, cools by releasing x-rays from its surface. And it disappears, uh, it cools down in, in matter of minutes. So this is one suggestion. The other suggestion is the um, magnetic field line reconnection, because these are twisted uh, magnetic field lines. And basically that could also produce a surge of um, radiation uh, from the magnetic field line reconnection. Giant flares. Um, there are three sources that have shown uh, two in our galaxy and one in the Large Magellanic Cloud have shown uh, basically uh, giant flares, have emitted giant flares. Uh, just a second. Excuse me. So this one is not a dinosaur, it's a giant flare. And the reason you see this very weird shape is because when the instrument was observing or detected this particular emission, had to uh, turn around and train the field of view to the source. And while it was uh, turning around, it lost the field because it was detected with a bat and then we wanted to observe it with the XRT, with SWIFT. So basically the bottom line is that this is due to the um, re-pointing of the source. You can see very clearly these uh, repetitions, which is the same uh, trend. It shows the spin of the neutron star. The peak flux is five arcs per square centimeters per second for a duration of about 0.16 seconds. Uh, the peak duration is half a second. And the tail duration, the peak duration is this little thing here. Uh, the tail duration was 380 seconds. The total isotropic energy released during this giant flare was 10 to the 46 ergs. And for the peak and five times 10 to the 43 ergs for the tail. So there's a big difference between the peak energy and the energetics and the tail. This is again here, I have the three giant flares that we have observed uh, recently, uh, recently meaning um, in, until like 1987, I think. Uh, so these three sources, this is the one that I showed originally uh, from 0526, the large Magellanic cloud, then there is 1900 plus 14 and 1806 minus 20. Kevin Hurley, who unfortunately passed last year, uh, was an excellent scientist and a very beloved colleague of ours, and he is the one who actually put together the international network for uh, all the sources for gamma ray bursts for the IPN, uh, for uh, gamma ray bursts for magnetars for every transient. So now this is a, uh, a gamma ray burst. We thought it was a gamma ray burst. It turns out that it's most likely another extra galactic magnetar giant flare. It triggered the interplanetary network on April 15, 2020. When you triangulate the event, when we triangulated the event, we, we obtained a error box with 17 square arc minutes. It was centered on NCC 253, the sculptor galaxy, which is 11 million light years away. Now there have been other claims, of course, that some of gamma ray bursts could have been extragalactic magnetar giant flares, but this one has a most uh, concrete credentials for that. Uh, the chance coincidence for this particular source with the NGC 253 was one in 230,000. Uh, and, oops, sorry. 
okay? And uh, the high energy emission uh, was up to several, uh, well, uh, there was one photon of 480 MeV and two photons of 1.7 GeV and 1.3 GeV. So there was a lot of energy released in this particular um, event. Now, so far, we have the giant flares from three sources in 1998 uh, and in 2004, there were two sources from our own galaxy. And in 1979, there was one source from the Large Magellanic Cloud. This particular extragalactic giant flare uh, actually was the best example of uh, four papers or suggestions, I should say, that there are basically um, all associated with magnetar giant flares in these galaxies. All in all, we should expect to have imposters, if you wish, of giant flares within the, the gamma ray burst population and the actual percentage of short gamma ray bursts that are uh, masqueraded um, giant flares from extragalactic sources, we roughly calculated about 10% um, of the overall gamma ray burst population. They are very prolific. Apparently, they are five times more frequent than supernovae. And this is actually courtesy of Ersin Gogus. Okay, I need to, yes. This shows the difference between this extragalactic solar flare, I'm sorry, uh, magnetar um, giant flare when it comes from the sculptor uh, and how we see it here and how it would look in the, uh, um, in the uh, reference frame. Basically, this is what you observe, and I just wanted to show if you put it in sculptor, you will see how similar it is to the other events. So let's. The huge amounts, so there's a huge amount of energy release for the giant flares during the giant flares of the order of the total rotation energy of the source requires a catastrophic rearrangement of the external magnetic field. During, in order to get that, time, that amount of energy release, you need a catastrophic rearrangement. Uh, in fact, we have a paper where we have seen the change of the pulse profile, which is also corresponding to the change of the magnetic field uh, the, maybe from a, a quadrupole to a dipole. Uh, so this enormous energy release in relativistic outflow produces a trapped fireball, which is modulated at the star's rotational period. So what you see is the tail, which is the fireball that is modulated as the star rotates. So the initial spike strength reflects the physics of the reconnection side, because we think that is a reconnection, magnetic field line reconnection. The tail strength reflects the ability of the field to trap the particles that are released during this particular event. The tail energies therefore are similar in all three flares, about five times 10 to the 43 ergs. The spike energy though of December uh, 2004 flare was a factor of a hundred higher than the other two. PP dot diagram is the diagram basically that tells us where every source resides. Uh, this is the period derivative. This is actually a very important diagram, uh, which shows all the sources with specific range of period derivatives and periods. So the PP dot is period and period derivative uh, diagram. Uh, magnetars live up here. Uh, some of these are binary sources here, and these are millisecond pulsars. And uh, there are two exceptions in the magnetar population. Uh, the exceptions are their spin periods. 
the this source, so these periods are less than 10 seconds, and this period is 24 seconds, and this is 76 seconds, but it shows, uh, I'm not exactly certain it fits into the magnetar per se population, but we might get more sources as we observe what would fill in all this diagram, all this space in the diagram. The original sources are here, the magnetar sources, the SGRs and the AXPs. Um, the, um, some of them are observed also emitting in radio wavelengths, and some of them uh, are just X-rays and gamma rays. Chris, I just want to let you know we're seven minutes before 5 p.m. Yes, so... I'm, I'm about to finish very soon. Great, thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to add that there is a new mystery, the fast radio bursts, a new phenomenon that is very popular these days. Uh, and uh, the important thing that I would like to add, I'm not going to talk about fast radio bursts, is that we have a fast radio burst associated with a magnetar X-ray burst. So that would be in our galaxy, and that would be the first fast radio burst, although it's not actually the same strength as the other fa fast radio bursts, but it is associated with the X-ray burst, which is different from the bursts, so the rest of the bursts in that particular source. The 2020 is a year to remember because we had two, 1818 and 1830, uh, and 1855, three, sorry, new sources, uh, the reactivation of two sources, of one source, and a very a detection of a very um, high uh, magnetic field uh, pulsar. So to conclude, magnetars are probes of conditions inaccessible on Earth, strong gravity, ultranuclear densities, and the strongest magnetic field in the universe providing tests of general relativity and quantum electrodynamics. And they are invoked at the end as the end products of multiple key transient phenomena, such as long and short gamma ray bursts, superluminous supernova, and fast radio bursts. And that concludes, sorry if I took too long. I, um, I'm afraid my time was more than I calculated originally, but I, I have to get to this meeting, that's why. <laughs> Okay, so now I need to remove. Okay, okay thanks so much, Krista. So we do have some time for questions. Okay. Um, so let's see if there are any in chat or, um, so let's thank Krista. And um, yeah, please, if you have um, questions, um, you know, either unmute, raise your hand, put it in chat. There are all these ways <laughs> these days to, <laughs> to communicate. Just choose yeah. one. Is that Glenis? Glenis, are you there? You should, I saw her earlier. Yeah. Hi. Mm -hmm. I didn't see you earlier. I can't hear you. Glenis, you're muted. Hi, Krista. Sorry. Hi, I connected. I, I demanded a password, which I didn't have. But when I did it on my iPad, I succeeded. But I can't run any controls on the iPad, so I can't, couldn't ask you questions during it. Um, but anyway, it's, it's thank you very much for giving the talk. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me, guys. Pretty exciting. So um, I have a question. So for this, these, you know, giant flares, which are pretty amazing, uh -huh. right? The one in 2004, did it like squish the ionosphere of earth i think or something oh my god don't yes <laughs> you weren't not gonna believe this but uh, i got a phone call from uh, a guy after that happened i got a phone call from a guy who had uh these doves the uh the um what do you call the doves that are traveling the the you release them and they go back to your place um and the messenger Messenger pigeons? Messenger. Homing pigeons. Homing pigeons, yes, that's, that's what they are. And he called to tell me that the giant flare that we found was responsible for the pigeons to get lost because the effect in the ionosphere and uh, in the atmosphere, I guess, uh, uh, affected the pigeons. They couldn't return. They somehow 
it affected the, uh, I don't know how, what else it affected, but uh, yes, it did make the ionosphere uh, basically day into night, basically. It was amazing. The effect was, uh, yeah, I hope we don't get anyone nearby. <laughs> But the yeah, pigeons, so I never I won't forget. Yeah, the pigeons, the poor pigeons. I hope they found, you know, after some time they found home. So my, my question was about, just to make sure I understood things, what is the kind of current understanding? Because you did mention, I think, two potential uh, physical reasons, right? One is the kind of, was that the, the kind of star quake related one and then the magnetic reconnection. So do we have a, a resolved understanding fully? Uh, no, Sorry. we cannot say one or the yes. other, mm -hmm. and most likely there, uh, some of it is of this source and some of it is of the different uh, explanation. Uh, we do not have a lot of, um, we do not know exactly which ones are due to the magnetic field line reconnection. We think, uh, the Maxim is actually thinking magnetic field line reconnection. Uh, but there are the other issues, the crustal quakes that the Duncan and Thompson are discussing, which release energy from the crust of the of the neutron star. So uh, I'm not certain, not me personally. We don't know uh, exactly uh, which one is the best uh, explanation, the best solution. But we're getting uh, this year. We have a lot of data. We're still working on them. Five sources became active. And uh, we have very nice results, which I could not discuss because they are too detailed in the field. And uh, I don't know whether that would fit a general colloquium or a specific talk. So Glennis, did you, is that a- uh, There's so time. I'll ask a, two quick questions. One is, so if I, if I did the numbers right, there's a border, you've been watching them for a border 30 years and there's a border 30 of them that you've identified and there have been five quakes. So that suggests that they have their quakes pretty fast. So one question is, is that correct reasoning that you know each one has a quake maybe more often than every hundred years? And then- the Giant if, flare, is it? What do you yeah, mean? Sorry, sorry, yeah, the, the giant flares that you were interpreting as a, as a quake. You have to understand one thing. Let me answer this one first because I have to go in a couple of minutes, but let me answer this. Uh, we do see them. Uh, because basically uh, they're uh, omnidirectional, so we don't have a problem. We'll see them if they permeate, if they come, unless they are uh, deflected or something else is in the front. So uh, we hoped, but we didn't have a lot of instruments for a long time that could observe them. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So not that we don't see them, but we don't have instruments because after Batsy went down, it took a long time for the next instrument with a, a, a wide field of view. So it's a matter of getting the actual uh, detectors uh, in space. But very roughly, would it be fair to, to say that they will have quakes uh, maybe once every hundred years? or I keep calling them quakes, but these flares for a given, it's a given magnetar will have a flare that frequently, or is there some sort of observational bias that is, you know, makes that reasoning wrong? So I to get a feeling of how frequent they are for an individual magnetar. First of all, we never saw two of them in one source. Right, so they're Only less in one, They're not very, uh, they're not very frequent. Uh, they have the potential, the sources have the potential to emit several of them energetically, if you mm -hmm. do the energetics, but there's only one that we have uh, ob uh, observed per yeah. source. Well, since you have to go, I'll ask the other question, which was, you mentioned these were tests of GR, and I wondered if there was a specific thing, since there's a lot of people in the audience who might be interested in that. Is there a, uh, can you give us a particular example of something that tested? Um, not that I can think of right now, because I, I'm trying to remember, but I, I'm a little bit stressed because Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Is there any quick question right now from anybody else before I disappear? I'm very sorry, Glenn, you probably didn't hear that I have to leave at five. Yeah, I'm really sorry. Mm -hmm. No, that's not, uh, I'm sorry. It's just that something came up that I need to fix. So Massimo, do you have a quick question? Or? Quick question. Maybe you told us, but... Uh, 
why they live uh, so such a short time? Uh, why the, these magnetars are so short-lived? Uh, because they, they release their energy they are very fast because they are actually their magnetic, the, the source of energy is their magnetic field. And as they release the energy, the magnetic field becomes weaker and weaker. And in the end, they just die off because they have no way to, uh, they, they have already uh, cooled off. So this has nothing to do with spin down, right? I mean, it's a different- They also spin down, but it's not kinetic energy losses. Uh -huh. It is magnetic energy losses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krissa. And Glenis, uh, uh, can you send me your question? Because I really want to see, uh, to, to respond to you, but I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> no problem, no problem. My Take sincere care. apologies for uh, not having enough time for questions. This came up, uh, it's an issue I have to uh, kind of solve uh, as a chair problem. So uh, I'm afraid I have to leave. Uh, thank you all very much. And uh, Glennis, I mean it. Please send me your okay. question. And I'll anybody else who wants to send any questions, I will be very happy to respond to them. Okay. And okay. Uh, Miriam, Mariam, please send, uh, send me all the questions they mm -hmm. sent you. Please, I'm, I'm very happy to respond to all of that. And I apologize for having to run. Okay, thank you so much. I will. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye. Take care. Bye.